Michael Burnham as Spock's sister is rammed into the continuity. Just ram it in there. Ram it in. Michael's in there now. We can't get rid of her because Michael's mom has the gall to say to Michael that Spock was the man he was because he had a sister like you. And isn't that great? Yeah, I called it last episode. I said that Tilly would be uh, first officer somehow. Saru, in an incredible lapse of judgment, would make Ensign Tilly the first officer. Now, how does that make any sense? I have no idea. But seeing as how Discovery only took place a few years ago, for me, like, Discovery was just a few years ago before she left to go to the future. So I guess I don't have to follow any rules anymore either, so I can just wear whatever badge I want. I can wear whatever uniform I want. I don't even have to wear this thing, I guess. Okay, so nobody in the world really believed that Book and Mike weren't in a hook, okay? And what I mean by that is that they were hooking up. No one believed that they weren't, despite what Michael was saying. But it looks like they wake up beside each other in some type of embrace. And it doesn't look like the first time. But they wake up in the Nautilus, which is in the shuttle bay of the Discovery. Still. It's still there. So that's a little weird. That Nautilus happens to just perfectly fit into the Discovery shuttle bay. But they wake up in the shuttle bay. And... We're name dropping like Spock five seconds in, and I figured, finally, we're in the future. We can let go of the stranglehold of season two. We don't need to screw around with canon anymore. We're in the future, where Discovery should have been to begin with, and we don't have to worry about nothing anymore. But I was wrong, and we're dredging back up the TOS stuff. You know, those old starships. We're dredging it back, and... It's screwing up my life because TOS for me is not just a show. It's my life. Okay? And when you go messing around my life, things start to change around here. And things that I thought were real are no longer canon. And I don't know what to do. And it makes it hard to do my job on this goddamn starship. But they... They, they go to Vulcan because, uh, like, they bring up this idea to Admiral Vance that uh, we're trying to figure out how to, how to figure out, like, we're trying to figure out where the burn started, basically. Where, where did the burnham start? And uh, he basically tells them that there was an, this program called SpongeBob 19, or SB19, I think it was called, and... Um, Basically what this was, was this, uh, this was like kind of like artificial wormholes, right? And there were ships that would go into a wormhole and they would peer somewhere else in the universe where the end point of the wormhole was. And yada, yada, yada. The Vulcans slash Romulans, because they are now unified, surprise, uh, thought that this was too dangerous. And they had invented that technology. And the Federation had pushed them to continue with the program even as they had reservations about it. And then the burn happened. And then uh, the Vulcans and, Ro and Romulans thought maybe the Federation forced them, forced them to cause the burn. Because they figured that the burn started because of SB-19. And uh, Michael has this cockamamie scheme to go to... Uh, Vulcan slash Romulus, which is now called Navarre, which has its own history now, I guess, because we're so far in the future. But I'll save you the details. Um, somehow Michael's like, oh my god, I'm Spock's brother. If anybody could bring them back into diplomatic relations with the Federation, it's me. And I was just like, What? Wait a minute. Okay, so... We've seen... This episode has a recording of Spock that Picard made in TNG. And this episode also has the appearance of the Coat Malat from Star Trek Picard. 
So now Picard, Star Trek Picard, is double canon. Because we've canonized it from the back end with Discovery, being from the past. And we've canonized it from the future end, with the 32nd century taking place after Star Trek Picard. But we also know that at the end of Star Trek Discovery Season 2, the events of Season 2 were more or less classified. So that nobody could know about Michael Burnham and the Discovery. But they know about her in the future on Vulcan. And uh, I guess that means... So any... Does that mean that anybody who mind-melded with Spock found out about Michael? And when they found out about Michael, they found out about the Spore Drive? I'm surprised that if you mind-melded with Spock, you wouldn't then know about the Spore Drive. Does he have that good of a mental block? I don't know. But anyway, uh, they spore jump to Navarre, and uh, they're greeted by the president of Navarre. And if you look in the background, this planet is supposed to be Vulcan, okay? But you can see a moon behind her. And I'm just like, holy crap. Is stellar cartography wrong? Like, I need to get down there and ask those guys if there's something wrong here. Because last time I was down there, I did not see a moon around Vulcan. And Spock said the Vulcan has no moon. But in Star Trek 2009, it has a moon. And in the motion picture, I think you can see a moon. And now in Discovery, it has a moon. So I guess Spock is now thrice decanonized in that statement. So I guess Vulcan just has a moon and Spock was just stupid. They basically invoke some type of uh, scientific communication ritual. Uh, Burnham tells him, do you still practice the old ways, you know, from thousands of years ago? And the president's like, oh, wow, yes, we do. And then she invokes some strange Vulcan word, some rite, and I don't know what it was. But basically what it means is that they have to have a tribunal to have a hearing, an airing of facts about, uh, in this case, the burn. And using some, what I assume to be Vulcan legalese, Michael Burnham traps him in this tribunal. And they uh, issue uh, Burnham a, uh, an advocate, basically. And the advocate is from the Kuat Malat, who we've seen in Star Trek Picard, which is some strange... Uh, fellowship of female ninjas. I don't know. It's, it sounds pretty stupid, right? But uh, the advocate beams on board and... Whew, what the heck? It's Michael's mom from season two. What the? Michael's mom is back. Whoa, this is crazy. This was the exact moment that started going off the rails for me. Because... I thought that it would be cool if Michael had to learn to not find her mother, right? Like, it just seems like we're, we're dredging up season two again. And, um, I, I, I thought that was kind of stupid. But anyway, Michael's mom is back, and, uh, they have this, this hearing, and Michael is basically trying to convince the Romulans and Vulcans who are living together on Navarre that... They need to share the data of SpongeBob 19, the SB19 program, because Michael needs it to get information on how to detect the origin of the burn, which could lead to solving the issue of the burn. And isn't it amazing that in hundreds of years, or a hundred and some odd years since the burn, nobody has figured it out on their own? Like, the Discovery crew and Michael Burnham are smarter than everybody on Navarre and everybody in the Federation. Like, they couldn't figure this shit out, but we're figuring it out now. A little strange, but Navarre is somehow as divided as we've seen planets way back in my time. Like, uh, Navarre is has hostilities between the Romulans and the Vulcans that are living on Navarre, and yet they are, they are willingly living on the same planet. Like, don't you think that if these races, if 
as advanced as they are, if they came together and renamed their own planet, they would have, you know, not, not have, have these derision, derisions amongst each other, like, but anyway, so there's a big brouhaha in this tribunal, and Romulans want to give Michael the data, uh, the Vulcans don't, and, uh, Burnham's mom is supposed to be her advocate, advocate in this, but she does the exact opposite, and instead busts Michael down a peg, and says, "Hey, no one else is allowed to is allowed to make fun of you in this show, even Vance. But I'm going to do it because I'm your mom. And God dang, I need my mom here to I need my mommy to come help me make sense of things here because I'm in Starfleet and I don't understand anything anymore." And then Michael's mom just says, "Why, why, why? You did this stupid stuff with the binary stars. You got people killed. You tried to steal." the Nautilus and go do a bunch of other dumb shit with, with a, a terrorist murderer from another universe. And basically, uh, you're stupid. And what we find out is that somehow this convinces the Vulcans, the Romulans, and the president of Navarre that, oh my god, Michael is fallible, just like us. We need to give her the data. So they somehow randomly give her the data. And it's on this, like, it's on this disc that looks like it's from, like, the 2300s. And, um, it's like some type of gold disc inside a, inside like a glass plate. And, um, it looks very strange, but whatever. And that's the A plot. But in the B plot, we're dealing with Tilly finding out that she's being offered the role of first officer. And she's going around and asking the crew if she can be their superior officer. Because we need to look after our feelings first. Feelings comes first, Okay. We need to say, hey guys, are you okay with me being the first officer? I'm about to cry. Wah. Everyone cries. Everyone's crying in this episode. It feels like everyone's just about to cry. I cannot take the melodrama. This is the first episode where I had to skip a little bit. Every once in a while I had to just do a little skip. I couldn't handle this entire episode all the way through because of the melodrama. This was like watching a soap opera uh, from when I was a wee lad. But, um, yeah... The Michael congr Michael Burnham congratulation was off the was off the chart, but mitigated by the fact that Michael's mom did a little bit of a dressing down of her, and the melodrama and the almost crying was just ridiculous. But most egregious of all, okay, was that Michael views a recording that Picard made of Spock during the unification two parter of TNG. That Picard secretly made this recording somehow. Just like how they had a recording of the bridge of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701D to show in Star Trek Picard. They also had a recording of Spock. And Spock is just talking about something. And it's, it's canon Spock. So now we know for a fact that according to Discovery... It is literally canon that canon TOS Spock is Discovery Season 2 Spock. That is literally the case. Even if you don't want it to be, it just is now. Even if it doesn't make sense. But um, Michael Burnham as Spock's sister is rammed into the continuity. Just ram it in there. Ram it in. Michael's in there now. We can't get rid of her because Michael's mom has the gall to say to Michael that Spock was the man he was because he had a sister like you. And isn't that great? And we are, despite the fact that we're in the future now, and we don't have to fight for the legitimacy of Discovery, we still have to claw back with these cheap power grabs by stealing Spock again. Even though we already did that, and we shouldn't have to do it anymore. But, what do you do? That's, uh, what is it, season... Three episode seven. Are we at episode seven now? Yeah, season three, episode seven. Unification three. This one has the gall to call itself Unification Three. The absolute gall. The absolute candor. Um So yeah. Let's check out let's check out my uh my little notarinos in my creepy notebook. Um at the end of the last episode, we seem to be teasing the fact that Michael may leave Starfleet. But 
in by the end of this episode, we've seen a redoubling of her spiritual attachment to Starfleet, which I thought was kind of interesting. It seemed like she was going to leave. She challenged herself to ask herself why was she really in Starfleet. She answers the question and then is like a born-again Starfleet officer. I thought that was kind of cool. Specifically, this episode, philosophically, had a lot more to chew on than the previous episodes. And that's kind of what makes this episode strong, despite its flaws. Um, if you look at what philosophical questions are asked in this episode that give your brain something to chew on later, is that one of them being that unification worked, okay, and that the Romulans are actually, actually the supporters of the Federation in this equation. The Romulans have done like a 180, and how much of this was because of the events of Picard? Uh, how, so we've seen this the utter success of Spock, but trampled by the fact that unification, while physically true, is not spiritually true for these people because they are still separate. They still consider themselves Vulcans and Romulans. But we've also seen the success of Picard's efforts with the Romulans, which is cool. So we're canonizing Spock and Picard into a into a a, a space where they are now seen as people who 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 aided Romulan unification, and not just captains and commanders. They are now they are now um, uh, diplomatic figures which is kind of an interesting reframing of those two characters. Um, we've also seen uh, the total airing of grievances against against Burnham by her mother, and her mother during this makes a statement that she is human through and through, which is kind of a refutation of what we've known about Michael before up till now. Uh, we, we've been trying very hard to make Michael seem like a Vulcan, even though she wasn't. And now we've come full circle. And now Michael is just a human. So what does that mean for a person's psyche? I don't know. Maybe we could really get into that a little bit more hardcore and with a little bit more of a microscope if this show was written better, but it's not. So instead we have creepy melodrama with people almost crying all the time. Like the acting... The acting on behalf of Michael Burnham in this episode was starting to get pathetic, but the overall picture was interesting. It was just the small deals that were poop. At the end of this episode, uh, Michael says that her home is on the Discovery, and Book says that his home is with Michael. Does that mean that Book is going to become a commissioned uh, officer in Starfleet, just a crewman? I think Adira and Book are going to be a crewman any second now. They're going to get a uniform, maybe with some kind of different rank thing going on, because they're just enlisted, kind of, or commissioned. Uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, for what it, for, you know, for what it matters, um, I like Book, actually. Book is an interesting character whose motivations are clear and isn't a complete clown. So, I think it'd be cool to see him in Starfleet. He'd probably be good in engineering. He probably has a lot of experience fixing the Nautilus, right? Or, you know, maybe he'll be good at tactical. Who knows? And Adira is probably going to be good in science or engineering. Because she was able to, like, upgrade the spore drive. Even though she's 16. And probably doesn't know anything about the spore drive. Because it's a secret, right? Wink, wink. Um... She has that that squid inside her that uh, makes her wise beyond her years. Much like how Wesley was wise, wise behind his, his years. Because he had a slug inside him too. Oh wait. No, he just had the Traveler. Yeah. Hopefully the Traveler wasn't inside him. Wink, wink. This episode had very few interesting space scenes or set pieces. But interesting concepts are presented, such as SB-19 and the Romulan Vulcan unification. Michael Congratulations is off the charts, but it's balanced with an airing of her failings by her mother. 
The appearance of her mother did nothing for me emotionally, although it was surprising, if hollow. Of using Spock's legacy for a cheap grab at legitimacy hurt this show and Michael. We still aren't free of the stranglehold of season two. This doesn't bode well, as the past few episodes were at least feeling a little fresh. A lot of reviewers online thought this episode was the best episode of Discovery, and I did not see that at all. Uh, maybe I just have a difference of opinion. Uh, the things I like about Star Trek uh, uh, were present in, in previous episodes of Discovery more so than, 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 this, than this one. Um, so I'm giving this one a five. Um, yeah, that's about the best I can do for that one. Uh, I guess ensigns can just be can just be first officers now. I guess that's normal. Like, there's eighty some people on the Discovery, and we can't think of anyone higher up than Tilly. Like, there's got to be somebody. Why are we falling back on this trope where only the people we see are the crew? Like, the crew is huge, right? Like, it's not just the people we see that are in the crew. Like, couldn't we have just, a few episodes before this, had Commander so-and-so show up on the bridge a few times just to look at them? Just so that we know that they're there, right? And then just have them be the first officer? I mean, why not? Why not just have another character? I don't know. They don't have to be interesting. They can just be some random officer. And what's with Tilly now being so smart all of a sudden? Am I missing something? Tilly explained to Burnham that they needed four black boxes to figure out the origin of the burn, when Michael thought they only needed three. I thought Michael was perfect. How can Tilly be more perfect than Michael? You can't be more perfect than perfect, can you? <laughs> 